Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you before we get started i have a quick favor i've been self-funding the finding genius podcast for five years now i've done over three thousand episodes and as you can see on youtube we're up over a million views on the channel which is fantastic the next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers, because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button, and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running, and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD, and working on a product to help people overcome these problems, uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going. And I love coffee. Thank you. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Natalie Mahowald. She's the Irving Porter Church Professor in Engineering, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Cornell University. And we're going to talk about uh, her work on microplastic emissions, transport, and deposition. Natalie, thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you so much for having me. If you would, tell me about how you got into studying microplastics. Well, <laughs> it's because of a colleague, and a colleague that I really enjoyed working with, and that is Janice Branny, who I, I think you recently spoke with already. And Janice and I had written some phosphorus papers together previously. She sent me an early version of that paper that came out in Science and said, you want to model microplastics? And I hadn't even really thought about it because, frankly, there, there isn't much data. There wasn't much data before Janice published that paper that not really enough to, to model anything or to understand too much. So, you know, I took a look at her paper and what she had managed to put together, and I realized there was enough for a, a really nice model analysis. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where 
having a group of colleagues who, who like to think about things differently. And so then we can ping each other when we, when we have different questions. And so that's what Janice did. And that's what got me into modeling microplastics. So what are you trying to model about them? Is that your forte is mathematical modeling? Yeah, I am a person who uses, I, I call them big models. So kind of climate models and really detailed models about the three-dimensional sources, transport and deposition of little particles in the atmosphere. So usually we call them aerosols or particulates. And I especially work on long distance transport of, of these particles. So I work in, yeah, I call them the big models, but the models that we use for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is climate projections, those kind of things. So I tend to stick new things into those models. And so to, to do that, you really have to have quite a bit of information about them. And so that was what the, the trick was with this. But with Janice's just amazing data, we were able to, I think, put together a nice story. Well, what, what, so what have you been modeling? What, what does the long-range transport of various microplastics look like? What are the sources and sinks? Well, what Janice had put together is she had this data set focused on the Western United States, but, you know, covering maybe six or seven states in the Western United States. And she had 18 months of data looking at the deposition kind of weekly of these microplastics. And she had very carefully eliminated local sources because the, these were remote regions. The, the question then is, is what in the world are the sources of these and how did they get there? And so we went and looked in the literature to see well, what people think are the sources of microplastics. And, and you, you can think of that. What we really want to know is what got them into the atmosphere the last time so that they ended up landing in these really remote regions. And so, you know, we look in the literature and there's quite a bit about tire rubber and tires, tire material coming off and being, you know, the material coming off the cars and being lofted into the atmosphere and causing microplastics. Then there's also some information about agricultural soils, that there's microplastics in the soils and that soil can get entrained into the atmosphere and form you know, desert dust, which both Janice and I work on. And so then that could be the source of these microplastics. And, you know, it could be directly urban centers, but somehow you got to get this stuff into the atmosphere. And, and this size particle can be kind of hard to get into the atmosphere. But, and, uh, and then finally, we had just done a paper talking about the resuspension of other kinds of particulates from the ocean into the atmosphere. Um, so, I mean, sea salt, if you go near the ocean, you smell kind of the, the smell of the ocean and uh, some of that is the sea salts, that salty smell is the sea salts in the atmosphere. And those are aerosols. And so the wave action kind of suspends water into the atmosphere and then the water evaporates and you're left with the sea salt. And it turns out at the same time, if there are soluble particles, they're also left in the atmosphere at the same time. And we've just written a paper about that with, with another colleague, Kim Prather, and her student, Gavin Cornwell, who's also on the paper. And so we hypothesized that also could be a source. So we took all these hypotheses together that, you know, and, and frankly, no one, no one knows. I mean, that's the whole point is no one knows what the source of the microplastics are to the atmosphere. Well, if, so we, I mean, if you were able to differentiate between what's local and what's not, or at least Janice was, how does she know? And where does this stuff come from? Like, what is, is it? Is it rubber you're finding? Is it fibers? Like, what are the nature of the things that you're seeing lofted into the atmosphere and carried over long distances? Well, so that's the next step that, that Janice is still working on, trying to analyze each one to figure out where, you know, what the chemical composition is. But, but what we did in this paper is we, we took a look at these different sources and we took a look at the deposition. And we kind of, you know, my part was really doing the source to receptor modeling. How much, if it were from population centers, how much could that be contributing? If it were from the ocean, how much could that be contributing? Agricultural dust, how much could that be contributing? Taking into account the weather on those exact days and what we know about the distributions. And so, so we did that modeling, and that's really kind of the first comprehensive atmospheric modeling of the sources. And so we came up with the, um, the idea that, indeed, you know, there is a lot probably of, of tires um, contributing. That's the bulk of the emissions. But the the, the tires are the wrong color. I mean, the reason that Janice figured out that there were microplastics is she's, she's looking in, in her filters where she's looking at that what you know, came down from the atmosphere onto her 
uh, filters to be measured. And there's these little blue specks and pink specks. And tires are not blue and pink, they're black. And so quite a bit of the fibers that she measured can't, can't be from tires. So we speculated that it's actually kind of the, the garbage at the side of the road being entrained by, you know, big trucks or something coming by. And that that's a big source of microplastics to the atmosphere that is impacting these remote regions she's studying. And, and we also think it could be the oceans that, you know, the, either directly, you know, the plastics we throw in the ocean. And we've seen all those images of all the garbage in the middle of the Pacific, you know, breaking down into microplastics, which are really, really small. I mean, but you, can, you can't really see microplastics very easily. They're, they're tiny particles. So, you know, micro means, you know, the size of your hair or smaller size particles. And so we think that those, uh, they could be coming from, from the ocean, either the breakdown of the big particles you can see, or actually even directly emitted, like from washing, when you wash it in your laundry, there's, uh, um, if, you, if you have fleece or something, a whole bunch of microplastics come out and that could go down into the ocean and then come back out into the atmosphere and back onto the land. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. So you mentioned earlier um, that it, was, it wasn't easy for microplastics to get pulled into the atmosphere and then transported. So, what, you know, that's curious to me. So what, what, what makes it not easy if they're so small and you would think it'd be very easy for them to get picked up and entrained in the air. Well, yeah, for, for particles that are in the air, they're actually pretty big. They, they're um, kind of funny shaped particles, but they're, they're bigger than what we usually think of as things that go long distance. So, you know, most of, for example, the um, desert dust coming across from the Sahara, cro- across North Atlantic to get to the, U- the U.S. that is long range transported, most of that is two microns, three microns in size, okay? Well, what Janice measured, some of these are 10 or 25 or 100 long micrometer long fibers. So the, these are, um, it's a pretty big to get, go somewhere. Now, the, the thing is, is the microplastics themselves might, just because of their shape and how heavy they are, they might last longer in the atmosphere than I'm used to for, you know, most aerosols that we think about. They, they might be it might not fall as quickly out, but they're a size that's not, that's not super easy to to loft into the atmosphere. Usually things in this size range are like dust, desert dust that are entrained into the atmosphere under strong wind conditions. They're kind of usually too big to be coming out of a smokestack or something. Now it it could be, they could be coming out of a smokestack. We, We really don't understand like what incinerators or dry cleaners could be emitting. So for the most part, we're, we're arguing actually that, that the resuspension through these kind of mechanical forces from the strong winds or the car driving, that these are actually a pretty good source of the microplastics. And, and that seems to be what our modeling and what our data gives us a most consistent view. Well, I can see that, you know, driving on the highway, right, the cars would uh, whip stuff up into the air and then it could be entrained. But what, what's a critical size threshold or morphology of a particle where it would stay in the air versus not. Well, you know, in cities, well, yeah, that there are a lot of particles that, that are fairly big. They tend to fall right out again, though. And so, you know, in addition, what happens is that most of our measurements about aerosols come from air quality monitors. And so there we're really interested in the tiny particles, the less than 2.5 micron particles or less than 10 micron particles, because those are the ones that can get into our lungs and cause damage. And so we don't actually know that much about larger sizes because we don't have that many measurements of them. We're we're not as interested in them, but we don't think they last very long. Like they might only be in the atmosphere, you know, an hour, two hours, maybe a half a day, and they can't really get them. So for someone like me who's really interested in long-range transport, 
the big particles tend not to be super important for that. But these particles seem to have come from a long distance away. I mean, she was measuring them in really quite remote regions and had eliminated local sources. So they, these microplastics are, are really making us rethink some of the, the fluid dynamics, you could say, of um, how particles sink through the atmosphere. So it's, Well, have you um, guys tried to set up like a, not a wind tunnel, but maybe a, the equivalent of one or a low velocity wind tunnel and you know, put some plastic in there and see how it gets whipped around and maybe an electrostatic precipitator or something could gather it. Uh, is there any way to model this like in a lab? Exactly. That's ongoing efforts are doing that. You know, we have proposals in and we're talking to new colleagues to do exactly that just because, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, the, the paper that we wrote that came out, um, and I guess it was just last year, it, it really just had a whole bunch of research questions. Like you shouldn't believe us. We don't have the only uh, answers here. We're, we're raising more questions than we're answering. And so we really need to better understand how fast these fall, either through wind tunnel studies, as you said, or simpler modeling. We also, we need to understand the sources. We need way more measurements. I mean, Branis, uh, uh, Janice had 313 measurements here, and that's 10 times more than anybody else has done anywhere. And so that's, we need a lot more measurements, different places, not just in remote regions, but closer to the sources. We need, anyway, we have a whole long list in there. And, and of course, we also need to understand better what the impacts of these microplastics are. So, you know, maybe it's okay that they're everywhere and they uh, aren't, don't seem to be decaying away, but it, it does seem a little bit concerning. And so that, that's kind of the most important thing is to understand the human effects in the ecosystems. But that's not what I work on. I, I work on more how far they can travel and where they can go to. Yeah, but how do, you, how do you know this if you don't know where they come from? Like, right. how do you identify these microplastics and then source them? Yeah. What kind, of, what kind of work can you do to do there? Well, we, we've kind of already talked about some of it. We have to go and make measurements close to the sources that we postulated. So there's, it turns out somebody else also had postulated that the oceans were a source. So they, while our paper was under review, they had published a paper that showed that there's more microplastics in onshore flow if it if it's flowing from the ocean to the shore than offshore flow. Okay, so that makes you suspect that indeed there's an ocean source of microplastics. But that's just one place. We need a lot more measurements of that. How much is in dry cleaners or incinerator stacks? And you know, go to some of the different places that we think there are emissions and and figure out what's going on. That's one side of the equation. The the other one is figuring out where the where the plastics came from chemically. And there's quite a few really neat techniques to chemically figure out more about the microplastics that Janice has been working on and other people have been working on. And with that, then we can figure out what the original source of the microplastics was, not this final source that we were looking at, but the original source. And, and that's really what we need, you know, maybe from both sides, but to, to figure out if, if we want to cut the microplastics. We've got to figure out where they originally came from and then how are they getting into the atmosphere? So kind of think both approaches coming from both sides is the way to figure out what the sources are so we can cut the emissions. Okay. What about the weather? Has anyone taken air samples in a particular area that's known to have a lot of microplastics when it's raining versus sunny versus cloudy versus cold, hot, and seen the, uh, the concentration of them? No, I don't, I don't think. I think, like I said, Janice has the most data so far. And so she looked at, you know, what, was, what came in with the rain versus what came in the dry time periods. But we, we still, yeah, I would say we, we don't know enough about how they're interacting um, in the atmosphere with the meteorology. So we, we need a lot more data. So no one knows how, you know, if it rains in a certain area, does it wash a lot of them out of the air? Yeah. We, Do they we, get it trained in clouds? I mean, uh, you know, is, is it just totally unknown as to whether what's happening? Yeah, right, right now we don't know that well. I mean, one, one would assume if it's a good rainstorm, you're going to move almost all of the aerosols um, because the water drops hit the aerosols um, as they're falling down and they pull them out. We think pretty efficiently, but we don't have enough measurements for microplastics to, to assume that that occurs. And I mean, there's a lot of really interesting interactions that could be happening in the atmosphere with the microplastics. I mean, it could be interacting with the clouds, especially with ice clouds. Um, and that's, that's a really important interaction. We don't have very many, um, they're called ice nucleating particles. And so if microplastics act as ice nucleating particles, then they're 
that could be really important for whether or not you get a it's called you know a cirrus cloud or a stratus cloud or something that 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 kind of change can change the radiative budget as well you know which warm or cool a planet as well as change whether or not it precipitates so those kind of things we don't know yet we we we're submitting proposals to take a look at those but it this opens a lot of questions and, and people haven't really looked at microplastics very much. So it, it's a very exciting area to work in because we, we know so little and we're really trying to figure out what's going on. But it is sometimes a little frustrating because the really simple questions we, we don't we don't have the answer to yet. Well, what do you feel like you're close on the trail of with uh, with your research? Well, yeah, we're. I, I've probably told you most of most of our ideas at this point of what, what we're really trying to go after, you know, the chemical composition okay. of them are um, we, we can use then to determine what the original sources are. We need way more measurements and and need both in the source areas as well as downwind to figure out what's going where and then understand the impacts in the atmosphere and then also on humans and ecosystems. So all of those areas are kind of open questions and we're, we're trying to move forward on the ones that, that we can as much as possible. I guess it sounds like, you know, the ocean, right. There's a wave action which can break stuff up and then things get aerosolized in non-ocean systems like lakes. Maybe if there's an area of a lot of turbulence or like a waterfall, maybe it would have the same effect, but I guess we'd probably expect to see a lot less microplastics being liberated from more stiller bodies of water than ocean. Yeah, maybe, but they might have higher concentrations because we might be putting more microplastics um, into the the rivers. So I I think that's an open question, which one would be more of a source there. I mean, fundamentally, in the beginning, the humans who live on land primarily are the source of of these. It's just how are they moving through the system? And there's beginnings to have some estimates, for example, of how much microplastics are making their way through the rivers into the oceans. But I'm not sure that we have the estimates, good enough estimates to know, you know, in a place like New York City or something, where are most of the microplastics coming from or, you know, San Francisco, any of these cities. Yeah, it's still an open question, I would say. Well, what about uh, sewage treatment? I would bet there's tons of plastics in there. And then, you know, the flocculation and the settling tanks and all the other stuff and the action there might be a very big source of it. Yeah, anyone- yeah I think it's something to look at now. I mean, it, it turns out that any microplastics in the water supply kind of preferentially come out in the, the um, bio waste. And then, I mean, the reason that the agricultural soils tend to have so much microplastics is because we put so much of the bio waste onto the agricultural soils in, in the U.S. as well as in Canada. And so that's why we speculate that there's so much agricultural um, my, if dust gets generated on an agricultural field, that there's higher amounts of microplastics there is a good part of that will be the bio, the bio waste put onto the fields. Now, the other thing is that also we put plastics directly onto the fields. And so there's some studies, you know, very limited studies, but some studies showing higher amounts of microplastics on fields that were covered with plastics also. So I think that the bio, the wastewater treatment plants are kind of moving a lot of the microplastics. I'm not convinced that they themselves are going to be really good sources of microplastics to the atmosphere because it, there's not enough turbulence going there. But I'm happy to be convinced otherwise. Right. Well, I guess the final outlet of uh, water treatment, depending on where it goes, if it goes into a river or a stream, it could be a big source. You know, um, again, if it gets cleaned up, uh, you know, how much microplastics are left in it when it goes back into municipal, municipal supplies if it does. So yeah, maybe the system itself isn't very turbulent, but then what it ends up feeding, maybe, who knows? Exactly. No, that's what I think it, it could be more important is that, you know, all the, we, uh, the rest of the water that we have dumped all these microplastics into, making it into the ocean or into a large body of water that is more turbulent, as you say, that, that you can get the suspension. Yeah, I, I don't, I can't imagine too many microplastics coming off waterfalls, except for the Niagara Falls. You think about that, that's, that would do something. So maybe in some in some localized places, that could be a, a big source. It's true. It's something to look at. All right, very good. Uh, Natalie, so what's the best way for can they go? I'm sorry, we're breaking up. Oh, no problem. Uh, is this better? Uh, I think it's better now. If you could just repeat okay. the last question. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Oh, yeah. Where can people go to find out more about your work? Well, uh, they can check my web page. If you can spell my name, you can find my web page because it's an unusual name. And that's where we we put up our recent papers. Oh, and your last name is M-A-H-O-W-A-L-D. Is that right? That's right. 
Okay, very good. Well, Natalie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.